What is going on everyone? I'm Des with Despot and welcome to the Forerunner 645 Music Long Term Review. So just like all my other reviews, I tested this device long term over the span of almost two months using it outside for road running, trail running, mountain biking, road biking, stand up paddle boarding, but I also made sure to take it inside to the gym where I tested weight training, high intensity interval training, swimming, the rowing machine, and even the stair mill. But before we talk about those actual activities, let's talk about this device in general. First of all, it's Garmin's first fitness wearable that offers music storage and playback, and that's definitely its highlight feature. It's going to offer a nice balance between a mid to advanced level fitness tracker as well as including some smartwatch features. On the outside, it's an attractive and nice looking watch looking watch with a stainless steel bezel with removable industry standard 20mm bands and the stock bands, which do come in two different colors, are going to be extremely comfortable. However, I'm not necessarily a fan of the silver bezel and I'm a bit disappointed to not see a gunmetal color option like it's available on the Vivoactor 3, which is incredibly attractive. In regards to size, it's just slightly smaller than average and it's very lightweight making for a watch that you can wear 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It has a 5 button configuration without a touchscreen which makes it more tailored for the fitness crowd and it's easy to use in pretty much all situations whether your hands are sweaty or if you even have gloves on. And just like nearly all other Garmin's, it has a transflective color display that may not be as bright nor crisp as displays found on like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch but it's going to be much more optimized for long battery life as well as a very good readability in direct sunlight. For what's inside, it's going to have Wi-Fi for syncing as well as transferring songs via iHeartRadio. And then it also comes with GPS plus GLONASS as well as an ultra track mode which provides different options for different levels of accuracy versus battery life. And then just like pretty much any other Garmin, GPS acquisition is super quick, oftentimes just taking a handful of seconds once you've done an activity or two so it can cache your location. And the 645 also comes with a barometric altimeter which was accurate for me straight out of the box. And I'll dive in a lot deeper with the altimeter when we talk about the activities and workouts. The 645 has support for both Bluetooth Smart as well as Ant Plus sensors with the exception of power meter support. But it also supports their Verb camera, temp a temperature unit, lights, as well as their new extended display feature which I am super stoked about. They did go back to a clip-on style charger rather than the plug-in type cable that was found on the Vivoactor 3, Phoenix 5 series as well as 4Runner 935. But the plug-in cables did have some initial issues so I'll be curious to see if this will be the trend moving forward. For the smartwatch features, it offers basic stuff like weather as well as calendar events and it offers one-way notifications on an iPhone that you can simply dismiss. But on an Android device, you'll also be able to reply to text messages with canned responses that you can set up in Garmin Connect. There's going to be quite a few preloaded responses, but you'll also be able to add and create your own customized message. You will be able to pick up a call from the watch, but you won't be able to speak through a microphone with paired headphones. And finally, it does have Garmin Pay, and hopefully your bank supports it if you want to use that feature. Now, when it comes to playing music, check out my other video where I talked about it quite in depth, but I'll summarize it as well as add some additional details. It has about 3.5 gigabytes of usable storage for your tunes, workouts, and apps, and then you'll transfer up to 500 of your purchase tracks via your computer using the included charge and sync cable, but I wish you could do it over Wi-Fi like you can do with iHeartRadio. I was able to pair every single pair of headphones that I owned as well as Bluetooth speakers, but there were some that are going to be better than others in terms of a consistent connection. And then wearing the watch on the same wrist as the Bluetooth transmitter on your headphones definitely can help, but just see Garmin's website for their list of tested headphones to get the best compatibility. I do like the fact that iHeartRadio is accessible right in the music widget along with your purchase tracks, where it does have all the standard controls such as playing a single song, all songs, shuffle and repeat, and you will still be able to get audio alerts like laps and pace during an activity which will pause the music momentarily. Now, listening to music while not carrying a phone was great, but I do have to say that the music app did crash on me a few times in the first couple weeks of testing. On this run, it crashed about halfway through, however, the activity was not lost and then it restarted with the activity already paused. A bummer that it crashed, but not a bummer that I didn't lose the data. Also, it will run through that battery pretty quickly while using GPS plus music playback, but with that being said, the battery usage was about on par with similar devices. And unfortunately, there is no Spotify, at least at this point, and if you are curious if music will be added via software updates to older devices that do have enough storage and Bluetooth like the 935 and Phoenix 5 line, I wouldn't necessarily hold your breath, but you can make a pretty good bet on them adding it to a lot of their future releases. The 645 has all the daily tracking features that you're going to find on many other devices including steps, all day heart rate, all day calories, floors climbed, as well as sleep tracking. 
but it also does have heart rate variability to measure such things as your stress level. For steps, I found the 645 to be very accurate. In fact, probably a little bit more accurate than in my Phoenix 5X, which can definitely overcalculate steps due to its large size and hefty weight. It will track your all day heart rate in one second intervals, and I found it to be quite accurate and very realistic after seeing the end of day calorie calculations. Just like steps and calories, I found stairs and floors climb to be very realistic and much more accurate than the Vivo Active 3 when I first tested it. The Vivo Active 3 was a little bit finicky with its first couple firmware releases, and it did get better over time, but the 645 was good to go straight out of the box. The sleep tracking was quite good as well compared to my other Garmin that I wear daily and everything lined up, but I also made sure to compare it against the Fitbit Ionic, which arguably has very good sleep tracking, and I'm happy to report that the data was very similar between the two. All right, with that out of the way, let's talk about the activity tracking and all those fitness features. So first off, it does have Move IQ, which is Garmin's name for automatic workout detection, which I found to work well for walking, running, cycling, but not as much for swimming. But just note that these do not show up as actual activities, rather they show up only in your calendar view, and you do have to do a particular activity for over 10 minutes for this to register. The 645 also offers basic navigation where you'll be able to load courses, then you can use an old activity to trace your path, and then you can also mark a saved location. In terms of the actual activity profiles, Garmin trickled down a lot of these from the upper end models, adding pool swimming, as well as other not so common sports like skiing, snowboarding, as well as rowing and paddleboarding. So this is very much a full featured device, but it does not have multi-sport nor triathlon modes, nor does it have a golf profile. And then again, similar to more upper end Garmin's, you're gonna have an insane amount of customization that you can do with the data pages and the screens that are gonna be available. And there's gonna be an option for automatic scrolling of all of that data. You're going to have plenty of options for alerts, including heart rate, pace, distance, and tons more. And there's also going to be a metronome option for running, as well as automatic features such as laps, auto pause, and the previously mentioned auto scrolling of the data fields. And then finally, you'll be able to change the background from black to white, and you'll also be able to choose an accent color. So I did manage to test quite a few activities, and feel free to pause at any time to get a really close look at any of the data screens, but let's first start with running. Now for running, it does a fantastic job with GPS as well as heart rate. It tracked pretty much every metric very well, including stride length, all the mile splits, pace, as well as heart rate, but you will see some minor discrepancies compared to a chest heart rate strap, but nothing bad by any means and was very comparable in regards to average and max heart rate. Cadence was very good for the average, but I did see one spike on this particular run, but this sometimes occurs with a lot of other wearables and we will see this with my test device in the next example. For trail running, again, very good for distance, very good for stride length, very close on splits as well as pace over the course of the entire run. Average and maximum heart rate were actually quite close to the chest heart rate strap, even though there are going to be more discrepancies in the graph over the course of the run. Cadence was spot on, but here's where you're going to see the cadence spike in my other test device. Lastly, elevation was spot on, and don't be fooled by the difference in the height of the graphs. That's just kind of how they look on Android versus iPhone. So after doing a handful of outdoor runs, I took the watch inside and the treadmill distances were a little off for my pre-calibrated device, but I have been using that device for almost a year, so it already has learned my running dynamics. However, you can do a manual treadmill calibration after completing at least a mile, or at least what the watch thinks is a mile. Here you can see how the split times were off and behind my pre-calibrated device, and then for heart rate, it was very good for average and max, but it did have a few discrepancies in the heart rate. And then finally, there's going to be a solid data set for Cadence, and it totally nailed it in that department. Now, the 645 has a built-in workout for intervals right on the watch itself, which is going to be super handy, and you can even edit the sets on the watch itself without having to use your smartphone nor computer. Now, this works really well for outdoor activities, but I did also try this on the treadmill. It wasn't quite as sensitive tracking pace than my pre-calibrated device, which is fairly precise after almost a year of use. Now for heart rate, when compared to a chest heart rate strap, you'll notice again a little less sensitivity at the beginning where it took a little bit to pick up the rise as well as the end where it was a little bit behind tracking the fall in heart rate. So for this first road ride, you'll see that nearly everything lines up with two other test devices, but you'll notice that my Phoenix 5X actually was a little bit short with the elevation figures, pun intended. Average and maximum speeds were very accurate across all three devices, and here's an up-close look at the elevation numbers, and you can see that the starting and end elevations were all relatively close to each other, so my Phoenix was the one that was actually a little bit off on that ride. 
Now, one way to get a baseline on elevation would be to go into Strava after you've done your activity and then correct elevation, which in theory gives a fairly accurate elevation figure since it's based on maps along with your GPS route. And then after doing this, it yielded an elevation of 1,389 feet versus the 1,378 captured by the 645. So the altimeter is pretty darn solid. So the speed graph was good to go between all three devices, but now let's check out the heart rate. So it was very solid for the average and an overall very comparable chart except for one larger drop and spike in heart rate around two thirds of the way through. And then for the elevation graph, nothing out of the ordinary here and compared very well against both other devices. For this next example, again, all very good compared to two other test devices and produced a solid map as well as average and maximum speeds. Elevation, again, was actually more similar to the altimeter in the Garmin Edge 1030, which theoretically should be more accurate than any wrist-based altimeter. And after an elevation correction in Strava, we will see that line up very close to the 645. And then with heart rate, I was extremely happy with what I saw, although it was just slightly off for the max heart rate. So for road biking, I was actually quite impressed with the heart rate that was collected because cycling isn't exactly a strong suit for a lot of wrist-based heart rate sensors. And although road biking was good, now let's talk about mountain biking where things can get a little bit shaken up. Pun intended again. So for this first ride, distance and elevation figures were spot on between all three devices. All the GPS tracks were pretty solid, even on a section that I did three times just to show how they can veer off slightly on occasion. And then the elevation graph shows very similar results as well. And it's good to go on average and maximum speed, but now let's take a look at that heart rate. And as expected, it's not necessarily going to be as good as road biking or running, but this isn't terrible by any means for mountain biking. So for this next example, distance was spot on, and my Phoenix 5X decided to not have a bad day in regards to elevation, and then all three devices have very similar results. A super solid GPS map, and as we zoom in on some of the tracks, we will see very similar and very good results. And then here's a close-up of the elevation numbers, which were great. And then looking at the heart rate graph, again, not super accurate by any means, but again, not super off either. It actually started out the ride great, then had some issues on the second half of the ride where it kind of trailed off a little bit. So for mountain biking, I was incredibly impressed with the altimeter on the 645, and heart rate definitely wasn't as perfect, but that's kind of to be expected. You can probably still trust the average and maximum heart rates at the end of your ride, but definitely don't rely on it for zone-based training, and that's where you're going to just need a chest heart rate strap, and that can be said for pretty much any wrist-based wearable. Now for indoor cycling, I basically experienced the exact same overall result as road biking, but I do want to show you this particular example where it was quite good for nearly the entire ride, even following the purposeful rise and falls over the entire course of the ride. But I did experience one spike when I was standing, but that will change your wrist position and your angle, so that can happen in that sort of scenario. So the 645 does not have open water swimming profiles, but it does have pool swimming where you can choose the length of the pool and then you can trigger laps manually with the lap button. Everything was very much in line for pool swimming, and it will provide your swolf score, total strokes, average and maximum stroke rate, average strokes, pace, as well as speed, so plenty of data. In Garmin Connect, it will show your laps in the vertical orientation, but if you rotate your phone sideways, you can see a much more detailed information like your stroke type per lap. The pace and the stroke graphs were all quite good to go, as well as the swolf score. But unfortunately, it does not collect heart rate in the water, so I'm not comparing those metrics. So while we're talking about water sports, I also took this stand-up paddleboarding since it does have that profile built in. And the distance that it collected by GPS was good to go, even with making some circles here and there, as well as even hanging out on the water for about 20 minutes in the middle of the session. I would highly recommend starting the activity on the ground before entering the water, as GPS acquisition can be a little bit iffy on the water, and I'm not talking about the 645 specifically, this applies to nearly all GPS devices. It will also provide your total stroke count, average and maximum stroke rate, average distance per stroke, as well as pace and speed. Now, stroke rate was slightly off between the two devices, but we are talking about different arms here, and I very well could have been doing a few more strokes on one side than the other, but kind of neat that it does provide this profile as well as the data that it collects. So with weight training, it does come with the strength app that can automatically count reps as well as identify a handful of exercises. You'll be able to edit the number of reps that it did or did not count, and you'll also be able to enter a weight for that set. So it does a pretty good job at rep counting, but doesn't do as good a job identifying the type of movement. But definitely check out my in-depth review of the Strength Learning app, which goes into a lot of detail. 
But in regards to heart rate, it really was not terrible. And although it did not hit the max heart rate, it did follow the same heart rate graph somewhat closely, and at most times it was only about three to five seconds behind the chest heart rate strap. Now, with pretty much any wrist-based heart rate sensor, going into strength training, I pretty much expect not so great results, but the 645 was not terrible, even with higher intensity intervals at the end of the workout. But just like mountain biking, if you need a very accurate heart rate that's updated at that very second, you should probably look into our chest heart rate strap. Next up, I tried the Stair Stepper Profile, and I actually really quite like the Stair Mill as it's a very low impact activity that has a lot of bang for your buck. But for heart rate, the results were very good compared to a chest heart rate strap and was nearly identical. And then for rowing, it will provide your total strokes as well as average and maximum stroke rate. But for rowing, along with strength training and mountain biking, are the worst type of activities for wrist-based heart rate sensors, and it wasn't perfect. Being a little off at first, but realistically not all terrible, and it did produce a usable average as well as a max heart rate figure at the end of the workout. So overall, I was quite impressed with these data that the 645 collected. The heart rate, especially for the more challenging to capture activities like mountain biking, strength training, as well as rowing, was not all that bad. It was much better than the Via Vector 3 that I tested last year, and I think that could be due to the slightly dome-like shape on the back of the 645, which theoretically would make for better skin contact with the Elevate heart rate sensor. Now there are a couple more things I do want to cover that relate to the activities. First off, you will be able to upload custom workouts that you can build in Garmin Connect on your computer. And then it's also going to offer first speed technologies such as training effect and training load. And then you will also get Strava live segments and this is going to be available if you have a Strava premium account. Lastly, let's talk about battery life. So just like the Vivo Active 3, the battery life with the initial firmware wasn't really that great. But with the most recent firmware, I get about 5-6 to six days in smartwatch mode. 4-5 to five days using it for about an hour or so per day for an outdoor activity. And then only about 3-4 to four days if I was also listening to music. So what's the verdict? Well, it is great that Garmin finally listened to the masses and added music to one of their fitness wearables. It's an okay first implementation. I found it very convenient to use with its five button configuration. So it performs really well as a fitness device and I can definitely recommend it in terms of the data that it collects. But let's talk about price and this is where it gets a little bit tough. So I see how Garmin priced this strategically in between the 935, 735, and the Vivo Active 3. And I can see those interested in the 935 choosing this if they do not need open water swimming nor power meter support, with it being about $100 cheaper for the non-music version, and then if it wanted music, it would be about $50 cheaper. But where it gets tough is when you're deciding between this and let's say a Vivo Active 3, as well as comparing with other devices that are more famous for music playback like the Fitbit Ionic, Samsung Gear Sport, or even Apple Watch, where it comes north of at least $100 more than those devices. So the 645 is kind of in an interesting place in Garmin's lineup, and it kind of splits the difference between a lot of different devices, and it's definitely going to be interesting to see how this is going to play out with Garmin's future releases. But overall, I think it's going to be a great device that's going to appeal to a lot of people that will allow people who have always wanted the more advanced fitness tracking of a Garmin, but will finally be able to listen to their tunes as well. So are you going to be getting one, or if you already own one, what do you think about yours? Let us all know in the comment section below, and while you're down there, hit that like button if this video helped you out at all. Those thumbs up definitely help the channel out a lot, and I definitely appreciate it. Anyhow, thank you so much for watching, and make sure to have fun with your fitness, and we will see you in the next video.